Green, I said then, and we quote, serving on a committee isn't a right, it's a privilege. And when somebody encourages violence against a member, uh, they should lose that privilege, end quote. That's a standard that shouldn't be radical. Sadly, another member, Congressman Gosar, has done something that is truly beyond the pale and causes us to act once again. On his official government account, Congressman Gosar posted a video depicting himself stabbing a colleague, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. I heard a lot of things uh, from Congressman um, Gosar since the video was posted, but uh, one thing I haven't heard was I'm sorry and I did something that truly was wrong and awful and reprehensible. Is there no decorum around here anymore? Uh, is there no decency? Congressman Gosar and Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez serve on the Oversight Committee together. And the thought of having to look across the dais and, and work so closely with somebody who depicted your death uh, is unconscionable to me. I have to tell you, I've, I've, uh, I've, you know, I've been once again disappointed by the public silence and inaction of the minority leader. A stern private phone call here is not going to cut it. Threats against members of Congress are on the rise. We cannot sit back and accept actions like this as if they're the new normal. And that's why we're considering this measure today, which takes steps that I think are totally appropriate, and that includes censure. Now, maybe, now maybe the minority leader and others find political advantage in defending um, what Mr. Gosar has done or his behavior. Maybe their strategy is to win at all costs. I sure as hell hope not. I hope all sense of decorum and decency is not lost. And I hope that we can still agree that actions like this should have severe consequences. Let me just close with one other thing that I think a lot of members don't know. You know, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez um, has to pay for her own security. Um, and, um, and the threats that she gets uh, the threats that she gets come as a result of behavior like we have seen with Mr. Gosar. And it, at some point, it just has to stop. And so, um, in any event, um, I will now turn to the ranking member for any comments he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as I'm sure is the case with you, I don't particularly enjoy being here tonight. Tonight's hearing on very short notice is on a resolution censoring Representative Paul Gozar and removing him from a seat on the Oversight and Reform Committee for a video posted on his official Twitter account last week. Before I continue, I do think it's helpful for the committee to summarize the sequence of events. Last week, Representative Gozar posted a video that was certainly provocative. After the video was posted, Leader McCarthy reached out to Representative Gozar to discuss the issue. Then the video was taken down, and Mr. Gozar released a public statement making it clear that the video was intended to be symbolic and that he in no way meant to suggest or espouse violence or harm towards anyone. Earlier today, Representative Gozar appeared at the Republican conference meeting and explained the video in question. He also reiterated that he does not condone violence, does not endorse violence, and did not intend his video to be viewed as an endorsement of violence. As far as I'm concerned, I think that should have been the end of the matter. I also think that chronolo the chronology of events has been lost in the rush to meet today and the rush to condemn Congressman Gozar. Though his initial action may have been inappropriate, he immediately took action to rectify his lapse of judgment and to make amends. But instead of accepting that and moving on, the majority is instead rushing ahead to force a vote on censoring Representative Gozar and then removing him <coughs> from the Oversight and Reform Committee. This is in a clear contrast to institutional precedent. I would remind the majority that historically, the majority <coughs> and the minority have respected the right of each of their conferences to assign their members to committees. <coughs> Excuse me. The decision about whether to seat a member on a committee or to remove a member from his or her seat on a committee traditionally rests with the respective conferences. Earlier this year, the majority went against that tradition for the first time when they voted to remove a Republican member of Congress from her committee assignments. Today, they're proceeding to do so again. 
Mr. Chairman, this continues to set an extremely dangerous precedent for the future of this institution. In future years, this precedent may be used to give the majority veto power over the Minorities Committee assignments. That's a dangerous, dark road for the institution to go down. But to make matters worse, this is a road that the majority has not chosen for itself. There have been plenty of instances of members on the majority side using intemperate language or taking controversial and provocative actions. Yet the majority's never acted to remove its own members from their committee assignments. I could give you a list as long as my arm of such members, none of whom have been disciplined by the majority. That's deeply frustrating. But what's also deeply frustrating about today's hearing is that if action is necessary, there are two much better options of dealing with Representative Gozar's action than what the majority is proposing today. First, the majority can and should do what it should have done earlier in this Congress and leave this matter up to Leader McCarthy and the Republican Conference. Indeed, this was a topic of discussion at today's Republican Conference meeting. Second, the House also has the option of referring Representative Gozar to the Ethics Committee. This is also an appropriate course of action. It would give the Bipartisan Ethics Committee the time to review the matter, allow Representative Gozar to present his evidence and arguments, and give the committee the chance to make appropriate recommendations. But instead, the majority is once again rushing forward with a resolution to strip a Republican member of a committee assignment without giving either the Republican Conference or the Ethics Committee, the two appropriate venues, a chance to resolve the matter. Make no mistake, Mr. Chairman, uh, though Representative Gozar's actions should be questioned, the actions of the majority are going to make this problem worse. If the majority insists on continuing down this road one day, which I think will come sooner than my friends would like, the majority is going to change over. And when that happens, there will be a strong precedent uh, set giving the majority veto power over the minority's committee assignments. I do not welcome that. Uh, but I can clearly see uh, what the results of today's actions could be. This is a dark and dangerous road the majority is going down, Mr. Chairman. There's still time to pull back and reconsider. I urge you for the future of the chamber to rethink this course. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Well, thank you. And let me let just say, let's not lose sight of what exactly uh, is in the video. Um, Gosar swings two swords at a foe whose face has been replaced by that of Biden. Uh, in another scene, um, Ocasio-Cortez's face is edited over one of the faces. Uh, Gosar flies into the air and slashes her in the back of the neck, killing her. Now, if an average citizen tweeted this, they might get a visit from the severe, from the severest, uh, of the severest kind from the FBI. Uh, and I should also uh, point out that um, uh, Mr. Gosar's staff actually defended the video on, on Monday night. Uh, telling us all to relax. Um, so, I mean, um, well, whatever. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to welcome our witnesses today. Um, uh, Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wolorski, and Representative Escobar, we are grateful that you are here. Um, I now uh, recognize the gentleman from Florida, uh, Chairman Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, or Representative Esquire, Ranking Member Wolarski, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I am saddened to be testifying before the Rules Committee for a second time in this Congress. Once again, it is the refusal to apologize, the refusal to show basic human decency, and the refusal to uphold the reputation of the House that brings us together this evening. Once again, Republican leadership has refused to hold one of its members accountable for abhorrent statements, and incitement to violence, and so House Resolution 789 is an unfortunate but necessary measure. House Resolution 789, which was referred to the Committee on Ethics, seeks to censure Representative Gosar of Arizona and remove him from his positions on two committees, and I thank Representative Speer for leadership on this important resolution. This resolution and Representative Gosar's video must be considered within the context of our current political climate. Not 10 months ago, we all personally lived through and bore witness to the deadliest act of violence ever perpetrated against the United States Capitol. Some of our colleagues were trapped in the upper gallery of the House while an angry mob wielding weapons tried to beat down the chamber doors to disrupt certification of President Biden's Electoral College victory as that angry mob 
breached the Capitol, those in the crowd chanted threats to hang Vice President Pence. Since January 6th, Congress has faced further threats of bombs and specific attacks. Several individuals have been arrested for carrying out such threats. According to Acting Police uh, Chief Pittman, Capitol Police Chief Pittman, death threats against members of Congress doubled in the first two months of 2021 compared to the previous year. In response, many of our colleagues have had to upgrade their personal security to better protect themselves and their families. The threat of actual violence against members of Congress is real, and it is growing. Now more than ever, many of us fear for our physical safety, which is why Representative Gosar's video and his subsequent public statements trivializing his conduct are so deeply concerning. In the video posted from Representative Gosar's official Twitter account on November 7th, an animated figure bearing his image stabs and appears to kill a larger character on which Representative Ocasio-Cortez's face is superimposed. Later in the video, the animated figure with Gosar's face lunges at, at President Biden with two swords drawn, ready to slash, and the video also includes images beneath a frame of spattered blood. These are depictions of violence against elected public officials posted by another elected official. The urgency here as Representative Gosar has suggested the murder of a colleague who serves on a committee on which he himself serves. The House cannot normalize this abhorrent behavior. Depictions of violence against elected officials can encourage others to inflict actual violence, which further jeopardizes the safety of our colleagues. And any member who uses his public platform to suggest physical violence in any form against a colleague and against the President of the United States reflects extreme discredit on this body. Such conduct violates the most basic standards of collegiality, civil discourse, and public decency. House Resolution 789 was referred to the Ethics Committee, but the Ethics Committee cannot remove a member from a committee, nor can the committee censure a member. The committee can recommend these sanctions, and only after an investigative subcommittee has been impaneled and makes such a recommendation to the full committee. The ultimate power to censure a member of Congress and remove him from committees rests with the House. There are no open factual questions here. There are no questions of intent. The video is clear on its face. It is clear from the content of the horrible video and from Representative Gosar's public comments minimizing it that his censure and removal from the Natural Resources and Oversight and Government Reform Committees is appropriate. If Clause 1 of the Code of Conduct is to have any meaning, and if we are to take seriously our responsibility to uphold the reputation of the House, Representative Gosar must be held accountable for his conduct, and that's why I support House Resolution 789. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Wolowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the level light's on. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here we are again, to my surprise. I find myself appearing before this Rules Committee for a second time this Congress without prior Ethics Committee action. I'm not here to defend any comments or actions made by Representative Gosar or his staff. I condemn all acts of violence. In fact, as a member of Congress, I have been a victim of violence myself. I'm here as the ranking member of the House Ethics Committee, which has not had time to discuss or meet on this issue. Yet the majority decided a couple of hours ago to bring a resolution to the floor tomorrow to censure Representative Gosar and to remove him from a committee he now serves. Either the committee should be given adequate time to address this, or the majority should bring this matter to the floor as a privileged question for a swift vote. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Escobar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the members of the committee um, you know, I, I can't believe that we are here talking about this. And it is a very sad state of affairs, not just for the Congress, but for our country, that we work in an environment where there is an unwillingness to protect the people who serve in that environment. You know, I um, was in the gallery on January 6th with uh, some of the members of this committee uh, as the terrorists tried to break in. And thankfully, we were uh, able to escape before they made their way in. 
And I really shudder to think of what would have happened had we still been in there when they uh, made their way in. That was not my, my first experience with uh, the power of words and the power of imagery when, when uh, fueling violence. I, I, my community of El Paso, Texas on August 3rd lived through a terrorist attack that was fueled by a lot of hate and by xenophobia. And both of those things are in this video that Mr. Gosar and his team put up for public consumption using public resources in order to, I don't know, I don't know if it was to create harm, if it was to incite violence, if it was to fuel hate, but it probably accomplished all of those things. We have an obligation to live up to the highest standards possible, but also to hold each other up to those standards. If we don't do it, then we, what we are doing is allowing for a new norm to be created. And I don't know about you, but allowing this to become the norm on our watch it would be one of the worst things that could happen, I think, for any of us as public servants to look back and to say that we stood silent while violence was being inspired using public resources, a public servant, and that fellow public servants looked the other way. We absolutely cannot look the other way. I support this resolution. I think it's very important that we all stand firm and set a standard for one another. This isn't just about Representative Ocasio-Cortez, although I do think it says something very um, frightening and jarring that women of color in Congress frequently are targeted. But this should be about setting a standard where we demand that we are protected and that we will stand for, not for a new norm, but that we will stand for one another so that we can work together in a place called the People's House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I just, you know, I don't really have any questions. I just want to say, look, when I, when I saw that video um, posted in the aftermath of what we all went through on January 6th, I mean, my reaction was, what the hell is wrong with this guy? I mean, how do you, in what world is that an acceptable thing to do? And, you know, and in the case of Marjorie Taylor Greene, we said, if you threaten the life of another member of Congress, if you threaten kind of direct violence that might cost somebody their life, then you know what? You don't deserve to be on a committee. You don't have that privilege to be on a committee. I mean, that's, that's a really low bar. I mean, that's not radical. Um, and at least it shouldn't be a radical idea. And, you know, and, it, and it's, it's interesting that we have a lot of members, a, a number of members on your side of the aisle who are um, advocating removing Republicans from committees for just voting for a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, and um, what we're saying here is... Um, you know, that someone should not have the privilege of being on a committee um, if they essentially threaten somebody else's life. And, um, and I, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm really sad that we're even at this point, but at, at some point, people have to say enough is enough. And um, in any event, I appreciate all of you being here today, um, and I'm happy to yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much. I don't have a lot of questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would do have one to uh, my friend from Indiana. Uh, did the Ethics Committee ever meet to discuss this issue? Did, uh, uh, was Mr. Gozar ever called in to account for his actions? No. So 
with no trial, with no investigation, with no opportunity for Mr. Gozar to make his remarks, which he has made remarks in front of the Republican conference, and he has released public statements. Were any of those examined? Not that I'm aware of. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Torres. I, I'm just not shocked at what um, I'm hearing you know, from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. You know, when I first got to Congress, I served in a committee where the chairman constantly referred to me as a man. It was always Mr. Torres. Um, nobody stood up for me and said, have some respect. And it wasn't until yeah, I finally got tired of having to say, I'm Mrs. Torres, that I approached him coming out of an elevator and said, you know, Chairman, respectfully, I identify as a woman. So unless you're going to um, create a facility where I can use a transgender bathroom because you keep referring to me as a man. Please refer to me as Mrs. Torres. From that day on, he continued to refer to me as not Congresswoman Torres, not Mrs. Torres, but Norma. In this very committee, I was going to ask questions. It was my turn to ask questions of a witness that had come forward. But the majority of the time thought it was inappropriate for me to ask questions as a member of this committee, of this specific witness, and decided to take a break, a recess, and go over into that room, all males, Republicans, and try to figure out a way around shutting me down from being able to ask the question. And it wasn't, it wasn't until I angrily pointed to the crowd, you see what the men do to women in this building. I didn't realize that there were several constituents of that chairman sitting in the audience. The group immediately came out and asked me, invited me in, Ultimately, it was decided that I could not proceed. In a committee hearing, a colleague was very upset about my comments and made this motion as if he was going to shoot me. Nobody stood up for me. You know, it's, it's unfortunately that in, in, in this generation, Women still have to defend themselves against these biases. If they're not biases, then what is it? And how much time do Republicans need in order to do something about a threat, a violent threat against one of your colleagues? So let me just ask you, how much more time do you need to make a decision on what to do about your colleague. How much time do you need? Well, I would tell you as I've been a victim as well, and I would say any member of Congress that feels threatened should contact law enforcement immediately. And I think what we were even talking about here today should be, should have been an immediate referral of this tape. If people feel threatened, they file complaints, they go to law enforcement, and they immediately start investigations. We don't even do that on the Ethics Committee. So I'll ask you the question again, since you were not able to respond to me. Maybe you didn't understand. How much time do you need to bring forward a complaint against your colleague for the comments that he made, the threats that he made? How much time do you need? I would again say, any member that feels threatened 
can immediately go to law enforcement and should. That is what we do in the House. Okay, so do you not see that post, that image, those images as a threat of violence against one of your female colleagues? I'll respond for the third time. Any member. That do you, I'm asking if you personally, you, you are a member, you are a female member, you are my colleague I who I respect. I've been a victim before and I've gone to law enforcement and repeated it and, and reported it immediately. This is our workplace. Is this behavior acceptable to you in the workplace? If I ever felt threatened, I'd go immediately to law enforcement, and I, and I have, and that's exactly what the protocol has been. I understand the protocol. Do you believe that this is a threat against one of your colleagues or not? If I feel threatened, okay. I'd go directly to law enforcement. So let me apologize to you, because I know that this is very, very difficult place for you to be in. Um, if I made you feel uncomfortable, I apologize. But this is a very uncomfortable place for us to be in. As members of the Rules Committee and as a chairman of the Ethics Committee, ultimately, I think the Republican Party, all of you, need to think along very long and hard about what you stand for. What do you stand for? Do you stand for violence against women? Or do you stand against it? Do you, do you want to stand for violence against our democracy? Or do you stand against it? Do you stand for racism? Or do you stand against it? Unfortunately, the silence is a horrible response. I wish it was not the response that we deserve, that this capital deserves, that our democracy, that our constituents deserve. We're meeting to censure an individual that is causing great harm to one of our colleagues. A colleague that has been on the front lines of attacks by other employees, federal employees, like the CBP, the Border Patrol agents when we visited El Paso. You remember that? I'm sorry that we are where we are, and I'm sorry that you cannot um, answer very simple questions, whether you stand for violence against your colleagues or not. I'm sorry that there are 13 Republicans that were so courageous to uh, vote on a bill to benefit their constituents are now having to lose their positions in their committees, because that's been the priority for this Republican um, group. I understand, and I'm sorry that we're not following the procedures set in this House of how to even handle this case, to be notified of it right before I walked in this room and having a vote set up tomorrow that we haven't even discussed. I'm sorry about that. The procedure of, these, of this House is to have decency and common courtesy and a nonviolent work environment, not just for our employees, but for our colleagues. And, and I would say common courtesy hasn't even been extended to me as the ranking member. And I, and I am sorry for that. I know that you're in a very difficult position. I realize that, and I'm sorry if my questions um, to you made you uncomfortable. And I yield back. Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ranking Member Lorsky, just let me ask as a practical matter, normal procedure in the Ethics Committee, you receive a complaint, an investigative subcommittee is convened, as I understand, is that the normal procedure? It, it can be if we 
have conversation and do some preliminary talking back and forth. It can be, there, and there can be times that an ISC is assigned, but normally there's at least a conversation. So that conversation, did that take place in this case? It did not. Um, look, I think there are members on both sides that sometimes have made uh, some of their other colleagues uncomfortable with some of their actions and statements, and certainly it wasn't ref reflective or representative of the decorum of this institution. We heard testimony tonight that we should hold each other to standards. Um, <clears throat> feel obligated to point out that there was a Democratic member of the House who was potentially compromised on the Committee on Intelligence due to, to his association with the Chinese National. Did the Ethics Committee ever publicly announce an investigation into this member? No. Was there an investigation that was not publicly announced? No. Can't say. <clears throat> we had another Democratic member who made statements inciting violence against other House members and against members of the previous administration. Did the Ethics Committee ever publicly announce an investigation into this member? No. So now we're considering this legislation in front of us. Most of us haven't even had an hour to review it on another member's action without an ethics committee consideration. So what is the threshold that might qualify for the ethics committee to publicly investigate similar matters? And I'll ask that question to the chairman or the ranking member. Um, Mr. Burgess, I, <laughs> that's actually an excellent question. The House Ethics Committee uh, can commence an investigation by uh, forming an investigative subcommittee. We can also commence an investigation by the chair and ranking member agreeing to commence an investigation. Um, ultimately, the Ethics Committee is evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, as and it should be. As it should be. And thus, uh, it requires uh, at least um, one vote um, from uh, from the other side in order to have a majority uh, to move forward uh, on an investigation when a vote launches that investigation. But then again, as a practical matter, you do sometimes proceed, right? I've been here for a few years. I can recall some of your efforts at the Ethics Committee that have actually landed on the House floor. Presumably that was not a unanimous, I mean, that was not a party line vote when, when that occurred. Um, I, if, if you could be specific, I'm not sure what you're getting at, Mr. Burgess. Well, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee got into some difficulty several years ago and was a subject of censure by the, uh, by the Ethics Committee. Again, presumably that at least one member of his party had to vote with the members of the majority at that time. Okay. So it does happen. I mean, it's not impossible. I think, Mr. Burgess, it's worth pointing out again, as, as the chairman did earlier, that I think the reason, the reason that we're here is there, there are no factual questions here. There's a, a video. I know there's some reference to the fact that, that this is a, a new resolution. The video itself has been out there for several weeks, as I recall. It, it's a video. No, it's not the case. I, I don't believe so, but... Um, Several days, the date, it's a week. When was the video? Let, let's just be clear for the record. When was when did Representative Gosar November tweet, 4th. tweet this on his official account? What was the date? I think it was November 4th is what I've been told. November 4th. So it, it, it's, it I think, strains credibility to suggest that this is somehow new for any member of this committee, that, that, that the decision to look at a tweet by a member of Congress on his official account that depicts violence against a fellow member um, is somehow being discussed for the first time when I dare say, respectfully, Mr. Burgess, that this is all that most of us have been discussing since Mr. Gosar tweeted this on his official Twitter account um, at a time that we are just months away from the attacks on our capital. Well, I'll just say in my own, in my own case, I did not hear about this until I had returned I was involved with 
veterans activities all last week. I don't can't say that I uh, had heard or devoted any thought or I didn't even see the cartoon until today. Have, have, I presume you've watched it, Mr. Deutsch. Have you watched the, the video? Uh, yes. Mr. Ranking Member Olarski, did you watch it? And subtle is the word that I would have, would, you know, it doesn't apply in this case, but it wasn't, it wasn't overt. When I saw it the first time, I had to look at it several times before I got the same impression that everyone's been talking about. It's almost as if we've elevated this and now made it more of a problem than it ever was. And I wonder why we do that sometimes. Well, it does concern me that the Rules Committee is now becoming the Committee of Political Expediency when we want to uh, remove a member from their committee assignments. And I do agree with the ranking member of the Rules Committee that there is the possibility that there will be a different structure in the House of Representatives in the next Congress. And I don't want to see this type of activity continue. I don't think it's right when you do it. It won't be right if we do it. And it's, uh, I think we all have an obligation to treat each other with respect. But at the same time, I don't think it shows great respect for the Rules Committee to be, for us to be having this discussion tonight. And I yield back. Um, I understand Ms. Escobar um, would like to leave. Does anyone have any qu questions for her? Do you want her to stay? Or Thank you for being here. You, you can... You can... Um, I, 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 I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to stay if there will be questions. Yeah. I think you, can, you, can, you should go when you, when you can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You know, I'm so angry about this, um, particularly because I had a good friend who was shot in Arizona. Uh, thankfully, she survived, but some other people died. And, you know, she was doing her official duties, uh, meeting constituents. And I'm just angry with Mr. Gozar, who is a member from the state of Arizona. Uh, obviously, he knows this situation very well. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of the motion to censure. I will say, Mr. Deutsch, that I do have some reservations about the immediate stripping of committee assignments. I think it's probably appropriate. Um, I think what, I mean, the employee in the office, if it were our office, would have been fired on the spot for having done something like that. Um, but I, I want to hear the rest of the questioning and, and uh, just appreciate uh, bringing this forth because it cannot be accepted. Censure is uh, the obvious uh, punishment here. Expulsion requires two-thirds of us. Mr. Gozar, in my opinion, knows better. And uh, I'm going to yield back to the chair, but I may have some more questions after listening to the entire Thank panel. You. Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, and of course, I associate my remarks with the ranking member. Uh, Chairman uh, DeWitch, I just wanted to follow up on some questions that Dr. Burgess was asking you and just to get some clarification. Uh, you seem to indicate that you had hesitancy bringing this before ethics because you weren't sure what the results would be in the ethics committee. And again, I just want to get clarification. And no, it's never, it's never a consideration. That's never a consideration. The committee ultimately makes decisions. Um, we vote like every other committee. 
so, yeah, and I'm, this is not a gotcha question. I'm really trying to understand here. But when um, Dr. Burgess was saying that they're basically saying, why didn't this go to ethics first? My takeaway was there was uncertainty with how the procedure and the vote would turn out in ethics. That was my takeaway, but do you, do you want to clarify? Um, sure, I will clarify, um, Mr. Reshnafalo. The moment that we heard that this was uh, that there was likely to be a, a rules committee uh, hearing on this, uh, I actually asked for an emergency meeting of the ethics committee so that we would have the opportunity to discuss it. Um, as I said in my comments, there aren't factual questions here. Um, the ethics committee ultimately can make recommendations, and as the chairman laid out, there are. Uh, there are a good many reasons why moving forward with this resolution at this time is uh, is the appropriate thing to do. But I, I do want to be clear. That I want to like to push back against the suggestion that the ethics committee uh, has chosen um, to to try to avoid this. I actually had asked that we could have an emergency meeting so that we could take this up in advance of uh, even the rules committee. Here. Yeah, and chairman. That, again, that was this is not a gotcha uh, question. I just wanted to. I just want you to clarify. I, I have a lot of I don't worry about that. Yeah, it sounds good. I'm trying to get me or not. I know. Look, I got a lot of respect for you. We were on two committees together. We had legislation together. Uh, you know, I, I just want Feeling you to know it, this is coming from a good place. Uh, Ranking Member Walorski, do you want to? Yeah, I just want to interject that, that there was literally no time. The chair's council contacted our council as we found out we had to appear here tonight. So. There was no time for an emergency meeting. There was no time for anything when we found out we had to be here at 545. So I've just, I've just got some concerns because it seems like when we're not going through the ethics committee where the setting should be going through, we don't have the due process. We don't have, uh, well, Representative Gozar clearly doesn't have the right to be heard. He doesn't have the right to put on a defense before the committee. Uh, th that's unsettling to me. I guess it's maybe the law background. I just. The due process, the lack of due process here just does not sit well with me. Uh, and I'm also worried about the larger precedent within, within this body. Uh, as Ranking Member Cole was suggesting, there could very well be a shift. Uh, and we have a precedent now where the majority can dictate which members of the minority party can sit on. That's a, that's a dangerous precedent. Um, but if the door is open, it's frankly already been open with some of my other colleagues. Uh, you know, it's a precedent that's been set, and I just want to note that. Uh, Ranking Member Walorski, I, I just want to focus on Chairman Maxine Waters. In 2018, she said, and I quote, if you see anybody from that cabinet, referring to the Trump cabinet, <clears throat> in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd, and you push back on them, and you tell them they're not welcome anymore, anywhere, end quote. Did Ethics Committee conduct an uh, investigation into those remarks? Uh, no. OK, what about at a 2017 gala when the chairwoman said, I will go and take Trump out tonight. Did the Ethics Committee do a public investigation of that? No. What about during the Chauvin trial when the chairwoman said, we've got to stay on the street. We've got to get more active. We've got to get more confrontational. We've got to make sure that they know that we mean business. Um, by the way, those remarks were condemned by the judge, the trial judge in that. Right. Also said it could even be grounds for an appeal. Uh, but did the Ethics Committee conduct an investigation of those remarks? No. Thank you, Ranking Member. With that, I yield back. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, let, me, let me just say, again, the, the standard that uh, I think we set by the previous action we took is that if you, you know, if you, if you, I don't know how you want to characterize that behavior, whether, you know, being rude is different than, asking someone to be rude is different than threatening somebody's life. Um, and, um, and I, in, in the case of the previous action we took in this committee, and in the case of what we're doing here today, I mean, it is about threatening another member's life. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm having a, a, a tough time understanding why, you know, why this is so difficult. I mean, the, the, this is so beyond the pale um, 
He's a member of Congress. And he posted a video threatening the life of the President of the United States and a colleague of ours. His office made the video. I mean, they made the video. So, you know, I mean, and, and you know, and if, if his behavior was bad enough to go to law enforcement, you know, but yet it's somehow not bad enough for a censure or to deny him a, a committee assignment, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think we all have to, I mean, look, I'm, I'm if, if I, you know, and I hope and I pray that my friends don't ever take, a, you know, the majority of, of this um, institution, but if the standard is going to be that if any member threatens the life of another member, you know, that this action will be taken, I can live with that. I'm fine with that. In fact, I, I, don't, I don't understand why this is so controversial. Um, but in any event, I think we just maybe have a different perspective on things. Um, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Did you, Mr. Chairman, yeah, you, can I just I'm sorry. Add yeah, a I'm, comment for the record yeah. to Mr. Rushenfeller's question? Absolutely. Um, we're talking about investigations, and I'm saying no. But the, by the very nature of ethics, there, there's no public investigations. Was there an event, Mr. Sure, Chairman? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Were, were there any investig? Are you allowed to comment if there was an investigate? You're not allowed to. Really not. So I would just say there was no public investigations. Let me just rephrase the question. Okay. I'll yield back. Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank both of our witnesses, and uh, I believe Mr. Deutsch provides the essential context for understanding the shocking moment we've arrived at right now. To me, it brought to mind the broken windows hypothesis advanced by James Q. Wilson and a few other scholars uh, back in the 1980s, and the broken windows theory provides that if visible and pervasive signs of criminal and civil disorder and delinquency uh, go unchecked and unpunished, they will only encourage greater criminal violence and greater civil disorder. So the failure to act in the face of violence only invites proliferation of such antisocial acts. On January 6th of this year, a mob of hundreds a violent and inflamed and deranged insurrectionist literally broke our windows, literally broke our windows, and then stormed the Capitol, leading violent attacks on police officers. They left more than 140 Capitol officers and Metropolitan Police Department officers with broken necks, broken vertebrae, broken noses, broken jaws, broken ribs, broken legs, broken arms, missing fingers, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Now, on January 13th, the House of Representatives impeached Donald Trump for inciting this violent insurrection against us. And a month later, on February 13th, the U.S. Senate voted 57 to 43 uh, on a bipartisan basis to hold Donald Trump guilty and accountable for the actions he had been impeached for by the House of Representatives. That fell 10 votes short of the two-thirds constitutional requirement, but established a powerful bipartisan and bicameral statement that this violent insurrection had been incited by Donald Trump and his pattern of speech and conduct in the weeks and days leading up to the attack on the Capitol, and yet there has been a constant effort to deny these events, to rehabilitate the rioters and insurrectionists as people who came to hug and kiss the police officers. There have been constant efforts to lie about what had happened. And now we're beginning to see the fruit of that extraordinary self-delusion and the spread of that big lie. Last week, Representative Paul Gosar posted to Twitter an animated video depicting him killing 
his colleague, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and violently swinging a sword at President Joe Biden. We've seen also in the last several days members um, tweeting out the office phone numbers of 13 Republican members of the House who voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Members saying that they were going to teach them a lesson. They needed to learn a lesson. They've been called traitors. And it's been documented that there has been a dramatic increase in violent threats received by both Democratic and Republican members in this tense and hostile atmosphere that has grown up in the wake of January 6th. Representative Fred Upton of Michigan said he received not only thousands of angry calls, but multiple death threats after his infrastructure vote, calling it a sad day for America. And it is a sad day when members cannot even vote their conscience without having other members try to train the wrath of the public against them. Our Constitution and our entire system of law rejects the incitement of imminent lawless action and violence as somehow protected. It's not. It's not protected. Do we have to wait for someone in our body? Do we have to wait for one of our colleagues to be wounded, injured, or killed in this atmosphere? Are we really left only with the suggestion that if a member threatens the life of another member, that you should tell security about it? Is that really all the House of Representatives can do in the year 2021? It's a terribly sad day for our institution. And it implicates all of us in the shameful degradation of the values of this institution, the decorum of this institution. But I, I want to thank Mr. Deutsch for bringing this matter to our attention and bringing it forward, because it's a matter of the utmost seriousness as we try to protect the physical integrity and the safety and the security of members who've come here to represent their constituents. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fishbach. Chair, um, thank you very much. And I just have a really uh, a quick question for um, Chairman Deutsch. Um, Mr. Reschenthaler um, was asking about a number of disturbing statements that had been made by some of our Democratic colleagues. Um, and, and Ranking Member Wolarski indicated, I guess, that um, there was no publicly announced um, complaints or actions against them regarding those uh, statements. And I'm just wondering, did the... Um, did the Democratic Conference um, take any action or do anything about those, um, those statements that had been made internally? Well, on, on the Ethics Committee? Uh, and, uh, no, the, the Democratic Conference, you know, it, did they do anything internally regarding any of those statements? Um, you know, because some of them were disturbing. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure which statements and... and we oh, could, some of the ones can, that... Re, uh, uh, Congressman Reschenthaler was just reading, and and um, I, he read one um, from Maxine uh, Financial Services Committee Chairwoman Maxine Waters stated at a 2018 rally in California. If you see anybody from the cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and create a crowd, and you push back on them, and you tell them they're not welcome any anymore anywhere. I mean, was there anything that de the Democratic Mrs. Conference Fishback. did to um, to deal with you, some? Then there's others. I could read the rest. You you, you could you could read all of them, mm -hmm. um, and you can certainly any any uh, discussions of those at the time with leadership of the Demo uh, the Democratic Caucus. I'm sure is uh, on the record, and I I would encourage you I would encourage you to go take a look at whatever was whatever comments might have been made in response to those questions that I'm sure were asked at the time. But the, I, I, what 
just to follow up on, on Mr. Raskin's point and the chairman's point, I, I'm not, I understand the desire to, to try to compare language, and look at other statements by other people. The reason we're here is because one of our colleagues tweeted uh, a video depicting the murder of one of our other colleagues and violence against the President of the United States. And so on, on this, on the reason that we gather here today, I, the, the, question I, the question that I, I ask in response is, is, is there ever a moment, is there ever a moment, ever, ever, in, the, in this institution now, in January, 50 years ago, or 200 years from now, in which this institution should simply sit back and allow a, a member to do something as egregious as threatening in a video um, that, depicts, that depicts the murder of one of our colleagues, um, that something like that should be acceptable, ever. Well, well then, Mr. Chairman, um, potentially you could um, address when Chairman Waters, and I believe that uh, Congressman Reschenthaler read this, Chair, uh, Chairwoman Waters also stated at a 2017 gala, I will go and take Trump out tonight. Did the did the Democratic conference address this in any way? And and I don't know if it would necessarily be public statements, but internally, was there anything? If you're if you're you said that this should never happen, but in 2017, Mrs. one of your members did. To, to be to be clear, Mrs. Fishbach, what I'm what I was very clear about is what should never be acceptable is for a member of this body to put out a video, an image, or anything else that depicts the murder, the violent murder of one of our colleagues. I don't, I, I'm not sure what's, I, respectfully, I'm not sure what's complicated about that. But Mr. Chair, I guess you're, you're distinguishing between a video and a, and a serious statement, um, and I guess, I, so, so, what I am hearing is that the Democrats did nothing, the, the conference did nothing about this statement, and that it appears to be okay because it was a statement as opposed to a video. All right, Mrs. Fishbach, again, I'm, you can go I, back. I'm not sure exactly what the statement is. I'm sure there were questions asked at the time. I'm, you, I would refer you back to those. But ultimately, at this moment, we're sitting here seemingly Looking for way, looking for reasons, looking for a rationale to excuse an action by one of our colleagues in tweeting a cartoon depicting the murder of another one of our colleagues. That's it that's what I'm down. hearing, and that's what's so so utterly disconcerting to me. All right, if, and Mr. Chair, I mean, I, I'm with all due respect. I guess I'm just very. I'm, I, this is, and I understand I'm reading you a statement, you're not necessarily, but it was pretty well publicized in 2017 that she had said this, as I recall. And so I'm just trying to figure out where, at what right. point we distinguish these things um, so that we, so that I understand better. Well, I'm, right, Mrs. Fishbach, I would be, I, I would, I, I'm sure staff, yeah. I'm sure the committee staff, my staff, yeah. your staff can go back and take a look at Thank all you. of the statements made around whatever that statement is that, that you refer to. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, but again, it just feels like, and I, it, it and this is, this is, uh, this is what's so hard for me, and I think it's so hard for so many people who, who watch what we do here, uh, because it, it feels like what we're trying to do is to, is to look for ways to find acceptable, posting on an official government account a video in which a member of Congress slays, murders, violently another one of our colleagues. And I don't understand that. And it's, it's incredibly troubling to me, as I know it is to so many others. There's no, I, just to follow up on, 
Mr. Reschenval had asked a question earlier. There, there's, there's, no, there's no intent issue here. There's no, um, there, there's not a question about whether the video was posted. There's not a question about whether the video was posted on Mr. Gosar's official account. There's not a question about how he reacted uh, when this issue was raised. There's, there, there's nothing for us to learn. There's only a question of whether we're committed to ensuring that we take seriously our responsibility to do all that we can, both to uphold the reputation of this house and um, to act in defense of our colleagues and act on behalf of the safety of our colleagues. Well, and, and Mr. Chair, I, I really am trying to figure out, because this, is, this was a statement that was made, I'm trying to figure out if you take seriously the statements of, of both of, of members from both parties, and that if this statement was taken seriously, and, I, and I, to the best of my knowledge, it sounds like, because I haven't uh, gotten a direct answer, that the, that the Democratic Conference did nothing um, yeah. when, when this statement was made. They took no action right. regarding Ms. this okay. statement. Right. Again, Ms. Fischbach, you continue to refer to some, to some statement, and as I told you before, it's a statement that uh, I'm, I would be happy to, to come back to you, as our staff would, with a detailed mm -hmm analysis of whatever happened at the time. But what but where we are at this moment and and as we have these as we have this exchange is um, is a an ongoing effort to to try to um, accept, rationalize, push aside the publishing on an official Twitter account of a member of Congress a video depicting the murder of a colleague. And and I appreciate that and I will I just state that that this was not, I will go out and take Trump out tonight, was not a concern to the Democrats. And so they took no action. To the best that I can determine, that there was no action taken on that. And I'll move on. Ms. Wilarski, um, was Chairwoman Waters censured on the House floor for, in, for, any of this, for any of the statements that she made? No. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I just, I do want to... Um, before I yield, just associate myself with the um, with the statements of the um, of our of the other Republican members, um, and and just state that we are really setting a, a really <laughs> bad precedent here, and um, I'm very disappointed that this is how the majority has decided to deal with this issue. Barely any notice. Um, you, Ranking Member Wolarski indicated that she had just seen it when she got seen the resolution when she got here. You know, they're skipping the ethics committee process. And this is and, and that process is something that this body has set up and has used and should be respected. And you know, I'm, I'm just disappointed that the majority has decided to not provide one of our own members with the opportunity to do process to make his statement to to um, you know express what he was whether it was what he was thinking, but but have the ability to go through that ethics process that we have established, this body has established. And uh, would, would the gentlewoman yield? I don't know where it's coming from. Oh, Sorry. in the corner. Oh. The back. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I'll be done in a minute and then you'll have your opportunity. So I'll just, but you know, I think that um, we've talked a little bit about decency and I think that um, when we talk about decency in this body, the decency would be to allow the, the member to have the process through the ethics committee and have the opportunity to make their case and provide them with due process. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Yeah, thank you. And um, I just want to say, for, so while, while that exchange was going on, I, 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 I Googled um, the remarks that the gentlewoman was referring to. Um, um, I looked up PolitiFact and CNN.com and, and found out that what uh, the gentlewoman from California was referring to was impeachment, not about inciting violence. And I just want to say, again, for the record, that if any of my colleagues on the Democratic side um, tweeted a video showing them killing a fe fellow member of this body, I would be doing the same thing today. And so we can get into this whataboutism, and we can try to, uh, I think, I hate to say, mischaracterize some comments made that uh, by another one of my colleagues. We can argue over whether they were the best choice of words, uh, but the record was... Um, was made clear about what that was referring to. But seriously, we are talking about a colleague of ours producing a video, making a video in his office, depicting him killing another member of this body. 
If that's okay, then we just have a different sense of, of values and decorum and what is appropriate uh, in order to maintain uh, a, 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 a high standard for this institution. Um, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Chairman. So we're here to address the conduct of a member of Congress in disseminating and celebrating a video that depicts him murdering another member of Congress and attacking the president. And this is in the context of the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, which along with law enforcement and our national security experts have confirmed that the rise of extremism and irresponsible rhetoric have created a clear and present danger of political violence in our country. Our national leaders need to condemn such violence instead of condoning or encouraging it, whether against school and election officials, members of Congress, or other public servants. Instead, our colleagues across the aisle are more consumed with condemning their own members for voting for legislation that would improve our infrastructure, while tacitly encouraging grotesque conspiracy theories and extremist rhetoric. Think of what would happen in any other workplace if an employee were to threaten or glorify violence against a colleague. There would be swift and unambiguous sanctions, probably firing, but that takes two thirds of the body here. But here we see elected officials emboldened by the lack of accountability, engaging in ever more egregious conduct, placing both the integrity of Congress and the safety of its members at risk. I'm also tempted to be a mom. I wouldn't accept this conduct from a child. It's completely unacceptable from a member of Congress. So we know from research that when political leaders denounce violence, their partisans listen. The contrast here is that there's no apology to those impacted, and there's also no denunciation. When, as here, the research shows partisanship, pandemic, conspiracy theories, and social conditions have created conditions ripe for political violence. Politicians have the match to light the tinder. Mr. Gozar is using his matches. He's one of those candidates who's been willing to use violent speech and engage with groups that spread hate. And the video that he posted had at least 3 million views before it was taken down. I'm grateful to those few colleagues from across the aisle who've had the integrity and guts to condemn Representative Gozer's actions. But once again, Republican leadership lacks the courage to publicly denounce or punish such conduct. So Congress as a whole must act. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to say that I'm deeply concerned by the fact that any member of Congress would engage in official action depicting violence against another member of Congress. Remember, this was official action, and we've heard that today. This wasn't saying something out on the street, which shouldn't happen anyway, but this was using the resources of the taxpayers of this country to engage in this kind of communication. And this kind of conduct is dangerous coming from individuals who have been given the privilege to serve in the public interest. While strong disagreement is a natural part of the democratic process, our discourse must be civil and nonviolent. As um, Ms. Ganlin said, if someone were to make a similar post using the money, equipment of their employer in any other workplace, in any other industry, that person would immediately be disciplined or terminated. And my Republican colleagues would say that that employer had the right to do that. We must ensure that members of Congress are held accountable for words and actions 
that put the safety of others at risk, particularly when those members lack contrition and are unrepentant. This is an appropriate way to deal with the situation. It is an appropriate way to deal with something that was wholly inappropriate. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Neguz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have some brief comments I want to make, but first I just want to yield 30 seconds to the gentlewoman from California. I believe she wanted to ask. Um, thank you so much. I just um, want to inform my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that after the angry mob outside threatened to hang Vice President Pence, I introduced a bill to extend his security, his personal security, after he left office. Not a single one Republican, not a single one of you agree to co-sponsor that. So I yield back to my colleague. Thank you. So a couple of comments that I'd like to make. I support the resolution of censure and the removal of Mr. Gosar's committee assignments. There's no question the video that he and his staff posted is offensive, disrespectful, and dangerous. We've heard a lot about due process, and so I, the reason why I asked uh, Ms. Fishbach if she might yield is because I thought an example in recent memory might be a little bit illuminating in this regard. Uh, in January of 2019, it was a colleague of, uh, of yours, of ours, on the side of the aisle from Iowa, who made comments regarding white supremacy, if you may recall this, and Mr. McCarthy, the Republican minority leader, made a decision to remove his committee assignments literally within a week, a week and a half of those comments being reported in the New York Times. I don't remember many of my colleagues on the Democratic or Republican side clamoring for a referral to the Ethics Committee before Mr. McCarthy's decision could be implemented. And the ranking member, you're free to correct me if I'm wrong in this regard or if I'm remembering this incorrectly. If I'm not mistaken, that member, Mr. King, actually filed a complaint against Mr. McCarthy with the Ethics Committee. Chairman Deutsch, maybe this was publicly reported. I don't want to get into what you may be able to report uh, that's private. Against Mr. McCarthy for supposedly uh, not providing him with due process. And I am left to believe that that complaint, although I know you all have limitations as to what you can and cannot say, but clearly was disposed of in, uh, in a way that did not validate that particular member's complaint. So I, I think the question around due process, this is the point that Mr. Reschenthaler was making. I'm happy to yield for him to, for a moment if he'd like to respond to that. Well, actually, it's the ranking member. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, the difference there, is, and I, I get the argument, the difference there is that we as Republican Conference took our colleague off the committee. So, oh, it's, it, it, I mean, that, that's the difference. You, you are precisely right. There. You're precisely right, Mr. Reschenthaler. And this is my point. This was number two on my notepad. I have to write, I'm not as uh, uh, well-versed as, as my good friend, Mr. Reschenthaler from Pennsylvania, so I have to write some of these points down. This is precisely my point. To the extent that my colleagues are worried about a race to the bottom for this institution and the, the precedent that is set, we are asking, we are begging our colleagues from the other side of the aisle to enforce those norms. Because Republican leadership in the past has taken the step of removing members from committees, as has Democratic leadership in the past. In this instance, I don't think there's a single one of you who would post a video like this. Some of you I know more than others, but I have no doubt in my mind, not a single member of this particular committee, Republican or Democrat, would post a video depicting the murder of another colleague, period. I don't believe it. And Mr. Gosar, as Mr. Perlmutter said, knew better. And if a member on our side of the aisle did that, they'd be removed from their committees. And to the extent that is some new standard that is now set to become the precedent of this house, I am comfortable living by that precedent. And I suspect that the majority of the house will be. One of my favorite things to do as a member of Congress is to take folks on tours of the Capitol. I didn't know the first, when I was elected to Congress, I'd never been to the Capitol before I was elected to Congress. 
I came here for the first time during orientation, was elected the same year as Mr. Reschenthaler. And I remember how excited I was when I got my first tour of the Capitol and to be able to take constituents late at night, you know, pre-COVID, uh, on a tour of the Capitol. And I can hear Ms. Fishbarger saying she might not have been, you know, with, with COVID and everything. So I look forward to perhaps maybe the Rules Committee can do a field trip and the chairman and the ranking member can take us on a joint tour. But my favorite part of the tour is the old Senate chambers and showing constituents that room and informing them about the rich history of that room, the great debates in our country's history that have taken place in that particular room. One of those episodes that you all will recall having been on those tours or having taken those tours or guided those tours is when Congressman Brooks caned Senator Sumner on the floor of the Senate in the years leading to the Civil War. And I never thought that this body would be a place where violence could potentially return. I fear for where we are heading. The normalization of political violence has got to stop. And it is with that in mind that I'll be voting in favor of this resolution. And I certainly am hopeful that my colleagues will do the same. And with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman from Oklahoma. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, it's important to note that Mr. Gozar was confronted and that Mr. Gozar issued a statement that said he did not intend to issue, uh, suggest violence, did not condone it in any way. Will he apologize publicly? Would you? I, I don't know. Maybe what? you should ask him. But he's addressed the issue, uh, addressed it in our conference. So to suggest, and look, I don't approve of the video in any way, shape, or form, uh, but to suggest that he meant to do that when he is, took it down, that I didn't mean to do that. Uh, you know, I don't support that against anybody else. You know, it's just not true. And believe me, if we want to sit here and quote back and forth, I mean, things that you would think defensible, I would regard as indefensible because there was violence going on in the streets the summer of 2020. There were people being confronted at restaurants. And we had members of this body urging people to do that, urging them to do that. My friends took no action about that. My friends never discussed that. My friends never brought it up. We actually discussed this, dealt with it, uh, and frankly, if you didn't like our decision, the Ethics Commission is a, an alternative where you could have gone. That's not what happened here. And so, yeah, due process does matter. We're a country based on due process. I would grant that to people I disagree with. That's not been granted in this case. It wasn't granted in the previous case where we actually held a member responsible under the rules of the House for things she said, which I find reprehensible, but before she was a member of the House. We have no precedent for that. And so, please, until I, you know, see an equal standard on both sides, and I don't think there has been. Now, my friend may disagree. Fair enough. But if you think this isn't a precedent, if you think the tables won't turn someday, and I would not be for that when and if they did. I think that's a terrible way to operate. But I think my friends, wittingly or unwittingly, are leading us in that direction. Now, again, we can deal with it within our conference. You can deal with it within your conference. If we don't like what you do or you don't like what we do, then we go to the Ethics Commission. Or, as uh, the gentlelady from Indiana suggests, we go to law enforcement. <clears throat> there are ways to do this. That's not what's happening here. So if you made a summary judgment, fair enough. You got the votes. But... If you think this isn't a precedent, and if you don't think there won't be demands that's used again, I would just beg to differ. And I think that's something that ought to be weighed in these discussions and these decisions. Mr. Chairman, I, I have to insist, I've never jumped in for a second round of questioning on the committee as a rookie member, but, um, and I, with all the respect to the ranking member, there, of the 22, I believe, 23 members of Congress who have been censured by this body over the course of our country's history, the vast majority of them were censured a long before we had an ethics committee, or the predecessors to the ethics committee, the standards uh, committee, that censured for spitting on other members of Congress, for saying uh, disparaging comments on the House floor, those actions went straight to the floor. Now, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I guess I would just simply suggest that in the case of the example that I offered with respect to Mr. King, who was in fact removed from his committees with no action before the ethics committee, 
Mr. King made the same arguments that the ranking member. It doesn't require action before the Ethics Committee. Uh, if you decide as a conference you want to do something, we don't have to wait on the Ethics Committee. Sure. But if we are not satisfied with what you do as a conference or you're not satisfied with what we do as a conference, then that's the place to go. I'll rec I'll rec not to come here I'll to a 9-4 tribunal. Uh, uh, sir, you know, sir it, it, with respect. not going to be fair. With respect, I'll reclaim my time. There is no rule within the House rules or within the Ethics Committee's procedures that requires this particular resolution, uh, this matter, to go to the Ethics Committee before it comes to the Rules Committee. I understand that you've devised what you believe to be the norm, which is that if your conference takes action and the other conference disagrees with that action, then therefore it must go to the Ethics Committee. I understand that's your rule, and I suppose that what you can glean from today's proceedings is that our rule is that if any member of the House produces a video depicting the murder of another member of Congress, that member of the House will ultimately face consequence on the floor. That, I think, is a sensible rule. I would certainly much prefer that the minority leader take the same step he took two years ago when he removed Mr. King from his committees for making comments about white supremacy. I would hope that the minority leader would conclude after seeing this video that it would warrant Mr. Gosar from being removed from his committees. Minority Clearly, leader. he made a different choice, Mr. With minority all respect, you'll, you'll have a moment, and you'll have a moment. With all respect, he's made a different choice. That's his prerogative. But at the end of the day, it's clear that this majority intends to make a different choice. And with that, I'll yield. It's very clear. And I would just hope that you apply the same standard to your own members, which I do not believe you have. And frankly, the minority leader did take action. He did contact Mr. Gosar. The video did come down. There was a statement. Uh, repudiating violence and saying, you know, I did not mean it in that way. I do not approve of that in any way, shape, or form. Now, if that's not enough, I think he ought to have had an opportunity to go before the Ethics Committee, make his case. He didn't get that opportunity. Fair enough. You got to vote. Go right ahead. But don't think that these things don't have longer-term consequences. And we have process for a reason. Even when we think somebody is wrong, we have a process we go through. In this case, I think we've uh, short-circuited that process, in my view. And that's unfortunate. Would the gentleman yield for a moment? Yeah, I'll back up. Yeah, or, I, I just, I just want to make clear that, that Mr. Gozer made, have made statements to the Republican conference behind closed doors. And apparently he has taken the video down, but he has made no such public statement. There's nothing on his Twitter feed that got 3 million-plus views indicating that he had any regrets that he condemned the depiction of murdering a colleague or anything else. In fact, he is using that platform now to complain that he's being silenced and that the left is out to get him. So I don't think there's been the kind of contrition or denunciation of a depiction of murder of a colleague that one might expect if it were genuine. I yield back. One hour. Okay, um, May, Mr. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just, uh, I would ask without exception, could we put Mr. Gozar's statement in the record without objection? Uh, with, without objection, yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, okay, we all set. We all set? Well, I was just wondering, are we talking about the statement that he made before the Republican conference? Because. Yeah, okay. his official statement. Put your mic on. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do not espouse violence or harm toward any member of Congress or Mr. Biden. The video depicts the uh, fight taking place next week on the House floor and symbolizes the battle of the soul of America uh, when Congress takes up Mr. Biden's massive $4 trillion spending bill that includes amnesty for millions of illegal aliens already in our country and was not meant to depict any harm or violence against anyone portrayed uh, I don't even know the popular the pronunciation, what, Amin or whatever. Uh, not, not, not a uh, genre I'm familiar with. The video's uh, truly a symbolic portrayal of a fight over immigration policy. So, you know, he clearly denounces violence and says he certainly didn't mean it. Um, can I read something? It, 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 it's, uh, Mr. Torres. This is a statement that is actually posted on his uh, Twitter account um, where, you know, he says that the left hates that I am standing up and speaking out 
about the provisions in the Build Back Better plan. So he is not sorry for putting out that statement. All, he's, all he is doing is trying to talk around the issue and refusing to take responsibility for his actions, including actions by other members that have incited an insurrection on this building. Thank you. Um, I think we're all set here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Appreciate you, uh, you both being here. And I, I, let, me, let me just say that um, um, I really do think this is an unfortunate uh, moment. Um, and and I and I have to say that um, and I and I agree with what Mr. Nagu said that I don't think there's a single Republican here who would ever post anything like that on their on their social media. Um, I mean, I, I, I have so I have incredible respect for everybody. My friend Ms. Wolos Wol 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 as well, who I think really do revere this institution. Uh, have great respect for this institution. Um, but I, I got to tell you, I think we, we, we have to find a way. Uh, I, I would hope my colleagues would find a way to distance themselves from this because it is, um, I know this is not who any of you are, uh, but this, is, this, this really is uh, a, a disgraceful uh, episode uh, here in the House of Representatives. And I just, uh, you know, well, anyway, I think we've all said enough. So I thank you both for being here. You can leave. Um, you're all set. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any members who wish to testify on H. Res. 789? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on H. Res. 789. At this time, the um, chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R.S. 789, centering Representative Paul Gozer, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ethics or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the resolution. The rule provides that the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report shall be considered as adopted and the resolution as amended shall be considered as read. I yield back. You've heard the motion from the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Is there any um, amendment or discussion? Mr. Cole. Um, uh, so now, uh, hearing none, now the question is on the motion offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Any opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Mr. Chair, on that, we would uh, request a recorded vote. The gentleman has asked for a recorded vote. The clerk will. Call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Askin. Aye. Mr. Askin. Aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Desonier. Aye. Mr. Desonier. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Negus. Aye. Mr. Negus. Aye. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Reschenthaler. Yeah. Mr. Reschenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Uh, the, uh, with, uh, the clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, four nays. And the motion is agreed to. And um, Ms. Scanlon will carry it for the Democrats. And I'll carry it for the Republicans. All right. Without objection, the committee is adjourned.